everybody. My name's Einer. We'll try this again. Welcome aboard, everybody. My name's Einer. I'm a risk reduction specialist with South Metro Fire Rescue. Just a little bit about me uh, before I get going here. Uh, that's me on the right with, at least it's my right. Your, anyway, that's me with my daughters. Uh, my degrees are in history from the University of Puget Sound, the University of Montana. Uh, in my free time, I like to write. Please, uh, I know that holidays are over. Well, some holidays, but uh, you're welcome to buy early and buy often. The book on the top of your screen there. I also like to paint in my free time. And that's free time when I'm away from South Metro Fire Rescue. I've been a risk reduction specialist here since August of 2008. And all told, I have been in the fire service since uh, March of 1998. So, uh, a little over half of my life, which is uh, pretty cool. The fire service is a good way to go. So uh, I wanna thank you all for being here. This is going to be one of the installments of my Disasters in History series. And it's and tonight's topic is the fires of October, 1871. Uh, this is one of the photos from those fires, uh, but it's not just the fires of October, 1871, since this is a, a local audience, we thought we'd add in more of our recent history with uh, last month's Marshall Fire. Uh, so uh, as uh, DJ, I believe, said, uh, put your questions in the chat box and I will get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, but you'll find, and those of you who know me will find that once I get rolling, I tend to focus on, uh, on the presentation and then I'll hit the, the chat box questions afterward. So the Disasters in History series, this is a series I came up with a couple years ago as a way to continue doing risk reduction presentations during COVID when we were all made to stay away from each other. Uh, and it, it comes from a couple of different sources. One is that history rocks. Durr, we're in the Historical Society presentation. But it's also what I've been doing for my life. That's, that's what I like. My, like I say, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree are both in history. And it's a way for me to share my love of history with other audiences, as well as linking history into risk reduction and how we can all be safer, not just individually, but for our families. And then as a, re as a result, how do we make our, our world safer for our first responders? My, my goal is to change your knowledge so that you can then change your behavior and change the conditions in which you live, work, and play. Some of the past topics are listed here on the screen. I have several future topics that I'll mention at the end of the presentation. Incidentally, if you are interested in uh, receiving the links for future presentations, I'm going to uh, put my email address in the chat box a little bit later. You can email me, put disaster in the subject title, or the subject line of the email, and I will add you to the, uh, to the email list. I'll assume that you're not referring, like giving me some feedback on the presentation, that the presentation was, was a disaster. Actually, you're more interested in hearing about more disasters. So today we are talking about these mega fires in 1871, as well as 2021, unfortunately. Before we do that, though, and a few of you who have seen my presentations before, I like to talk a little bit about psychology, human psychology. This is a photograph of my friend Tally Chereau. She's a psychologist based in both London and Boston. She wrote a great book called The Optimism Bias. And in this book, she argues that we as humans are hardwired to be optimists. And that's cool because then we don't cower in the closet all the time because we're so afraid of everything that's going on in the world but it also impacts the way we prepare for risk. And we do, some of those impacts, we overestimate positive events happening in our lives and we underestimate the, the chances of negative things happening in our lives. And that makes my job as a risk reduction specialist a little more challenging because we all think that good things are going to happen. We all think that bad things are not going to happen. So, for example, we, I'm not saying the people on the, in, in the audience today, but we all know people who tailgate when they're on the highway. And they tailgate because they've done it before without any crashes, and so they will continue doing it. 
They overestimate that they'll arrive safely. They underestimate that they won't arrive safely. People play the lottery because they overestimate the chances of winning. Uh, people don't make good choices uh, because they underestimate bad things happening. Up until recently, it's been hard to get a lot of residents in our fire district to be interested in wildfire mitigation because they just don't perceive wildfire as a risk. Well, with the Marshall Fire, that's shifted the balance a little bit in the in the favor of risk reduction specialists. So that's what the, the optimism bias is all about. And that's why I think it's important to add this component to the presentation, because ultimately it's not fair to consider the, or to, to portray victims of an incident as being ignorant. It's not fair to uh, accuse, you know, why didn't you think about that? Well, it's because they're humans. And so we need to give each other a little bit more grace. I also want to cover some fire science reminders because ultimately I am in the fire service. So uh, the fire triangle that's on the upper left of the slide there. It's important to remember that fire needs three things in order to exist. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. Fortunately, we're on the earth, so there's plenty of oxygen. Whether you're on the top of Mount, uh, Mount Everest or you're at the bottom of Death Valley, there's plenty of oxygen for fire. Well, most places anyway. There's plenty of heat sources and fuel then is anything that can burn. We also need to know the basics of thermodynamics. Now this is not a college physics class, but thermodynamics just refers to the way that heat moves. And if you can imagine a cup of hot cocoa or hot tea or hot coffee in front of you, you can figure out thermodynamics pretty easily. So with your imagined or real mug of hot of a hot drink in front of you. Imagine putting your hand over the top of that uh, the, the mug of hot cocoa. Not on top of it, but uh, not touching it, but a couple inches above. And you'll probably imagine that your hand is getting warmer. And your hand is getting warmer because of convection. Hot fluids, whether it's air or liquids, hot fluids rise. So that's why our hand is getting warmer on top of that mug of cocoa. Now you can move your hand off to the side. Don't touch the side of the mug, but put your hand about an inch away from the mug. And again, you'll feel heat from the mug on your hands and that's radiant heat. Finally, because the mug of hot cocoa might be too hot to drink, maybe you know the trick of putting a metal spoon inside that hot drink. And that metal spoon will heat while the liquid inside cools and that's because of conduction. That's because heat transfers through or moves from warmer to cooler areas through solid objects. And that's, that's what conduction is. And finally, I wanna throw one more big word at you, but I mean, this is, uh, this is an audience at the Historical Society. So I know you all have big brains. The word of the day is pyrolysis. And that is, uh, it's the roots of the word, if I remember correctly from Greek, are fire and process. And before something can burn, it has to do certain things. So imagine a fuel maybe a piece of paper. As long as it's in that solid state, it is not going to burn. And that's a major misunderstanding that most people have of fire. Solids don't burn. In fact, that solid has to absorb heat. That heat causes the remaining water inside of the fuel to evaporate away as steam. Then the dry part of the fuel absorbs more heat. That heat causes the molecules that are packed together as a solid to break apart into, or dis disintegrate into its gaseous form. And it's the gaseous form that actually burns. Some of those particles are completely burned off in the flame, or it, it, we call that a flame. Some particles are only partially burned. They're superheated, partially burned, they're blackened. And a cloud of partially blackened particles above a flame, that's what we call smoke. And that matters, and this will come up later, that matters because smoke is also a fuel. Except in that case, that fuel is already in its gaseous form. It's already partially burned. It's already completely dried. And in most cases, it's already hot. So keep that in mind. All right, another part of, another refresher course that we need to consider is that weather impacts fire. And these are the four types or four components of weather that certainly impact fire. And I'm sure we could all come up with this list on our own. Precipitation, if we have active precipitation, be it snow, uh, hail, rain, that's, 
putting more moisture into the environment so that those fuels are going to be less likely to ignite. Relative humidity is the amount of water in the air. If the air holds more water than the surrounding fuels, then the fuels actually will absorb water from the air. If the fuels hold more water than the surrounding air, then the air will absorb water from the fuel. So relative humidity is a big deal. Air temperature definitely matters because the warmer the air, the more water the air can hold and it can pull more water out of the fuels. And of course, wind is a massive factor. Not only does it blow oxygen toward a fire, it can also push the heat from the fire, the convective column, the, the hot air rising off the fire. It can push that rising heat laterally into other fuels. On October 8th, 1871, so let's dial back the calendar a little bit. On October 8th, 1871, weather was a massive factor leading up to these fires that we're about to talk about. Because October of 1871, at least in the Midwest, followed a summer that was known for its drought. And throughout the summer, hundreds of wildfires had burned throughout the Midwest, and honestly, from coast to coast. And so this is a... a a weather map basically, and I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later as well, but just to make sure that we're all, you know, thinking about this the same way. The uh, note, the, the temperature here, if you can, hopefully you can see my little arrow on my mouse here. This is the area where the temperatures were hottest on this day. There was a low pressure system why, or, uh, dropping into the United States from Canada. And then all these lines together here, these are isobars. They show differences in atmospheric pressure. And the closer that the isobars are to each other, that suggests that the winds are uh, increasing or the winds are, are more forceful. So we're gonna talk first about Chicago, which, we, which is right here at this dot. Later, we're gonna come up here, but let's talk about Chicago first. So Chicago in October of 1871, that followed the fifth driest July to September in Chicago's history. And unlike Colorado, Chicago's recorded history goes back another 100 years or so. Only five inches of rain had landed on Chicago, the greater Chicago land area. Nine inches was normal. Relative humidity was under 30. And the winds were southwest approximately 20 miles per hour in September and early October, which isn't too bad. But a constant 20 mile per hour wind will leave a mark. Now, Chicago itself in 1871 was the busiest port in the United States of America. Think about that. This port was not on an ocean. It wasn't New York City, Baltimore, Los Angeles, New Orleans. The busiest port in the United States in 1871 was on Lake Michigan. And it was the core, Chicago was the core of a vast extraction-based economy where raw materials were coming from all over the Western United States into Chicago where they were refined to some extent and made into shipments so that they could go to manufacturing areas in other parts of the United States. So on any given day, Chicago was full of corn, wheat, wood chips, cows, coal. There were 60,000 buildings in the, in the city at this point, 4,000 miles of track, 24 bridges over the river. It was a bustling city. 340,000 residents lived in Chicago, and they ranged from the super wealthy to the super impoverished. There was no zoning in Chicago at this time, so you could find homes amidst warehouses and taverns and vice versa. And we also had a new type of home construction called balloon, balloon framing, easy for me to say. Balloon framing is an important part of the story for what became the Great Chicago Fire because it was a cheaper way to build homes and Chicago desperately needed more homes. This was important because balloon framing required far less lumber. Although if you look at the model here, it seems like that's a lot of lumber. Remember that these, that balloon framing replaced building log cabins basically or building with solid logs. So less lumber was needed, the builders needed less skills, so they were cheaper, and they could be put up with less construction time, which is also cheaper. 
From a fire science perspective though, that meant that these homes, at least inside the homes, had more surface area and less density. And if we think back to the pyrolysis lesson, that means that all those pieces of wood could absorb more heat more rapidly and they had less density so they could disintegrate into their gaseous forms far more rapidly. There was also less, or excuse me, lots of air between the wood components. Stairwells were open and these homes were poorly insulated. Uh, heat was able to move from inside out easily and from outside in. All right, I gotta throw some, uh, a wink and a nod to the Chicago Fire Department in 1871. Chicago Fire, I should say Chicago Fire Department to make sure we're not talking about the television show. Chicago Fire Department switched from volunteer to paid back in 1858. There were, in 1871, there were 185 paid firefighters on staff, dozens of horses, because remember, this is a time when uh, Chicago, when the fire department was still horse drawn and people drawn. There were 17 steam engines, each of which could push a stream of water 200 feet with a 600 GPM pump. There were four hook and ladder carts, what we would now call tower trucks uh, or towers or ladders, that sort of thing, with ladders that could reach four stories in height. There were six wagons that only carried hoses. And from January 1st to October 7th, 1871, the firefighters of Chicago uh, were averaging about two and a half fires per day. That's a pretty big deal. They were only firefighters at that point, they weren't also doing rescues. They were not also doing emergency medicine. Emergency medicine as we know it today didn't really come about until the 1970s. That'll be a presentation, some other presentation. I don't wanna get uh, derail myself too much here. So we all know about the great Chicago fire of August 8th, or excuse me, October 8th, 1871. But there was another fire in Chicago on October 7th, 1871 that needs some attention. This was a fire that started in the Lull and Holmes wood planing mill. It's not a typo, it's planing, not planting. So wood planing mill. There was a steady 20 mile per hour wind, plenty of fuel, and this fire that started inside the mill ended up destroying four blocks of buildings in about 16 hours. Excuse me, so it started in the early morning hours of October 7th and it ran through most of the day. All of Chicago's firefighters responded. So if they were, if they were on shift, of course they responded. If they were off shift, they went to the station or they went immediately to or directly to the incident itself to help out. Over those 16 hours of engaging this fire, 30 firefighters were injured. The fire destroyed one hook and ladder truck and two steamers broke down for various reasons. So the October 7th fire left a mark on the Chicago Fire Department. And that fire burned in the blue circle or the upper circle uh, on the map here. Now on October 8th, 1871, the day dawned, the weather was the same. In fact, the wind was a little bit steeper. Firefighters were exhausted. Oh, some of the equipment was broken, the, there was a, an entire hook and ladder wagon that was missing because it had burned. And so what could possibly go wrong? And as I do my disasters in history presentations, I hope that members of the audience already start to sense these red flags popping up in their minds and, and they realize that if we're doing a presentation, clearly the Murphy of Murphy's Law is somewhere waiting in the wings. At this point, Murphy, what proverbial Murphy is no longer in the background. He's really running through the streets. And that leads us to the cow barn, 137 to Coven Street. If you go to 137 to Coven Street today, I believe you find the Chicago uh, Fire Department headquarters. Uh, just kind of cool that way. Anyway, the cow barn was owned by Patrick and Catherine O'Leary. It held two tons of coal, two tons of hay, and several cows because it was a cow barn. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Dennis Regan and Peg Leg Daniel Sullivan stopped in the barn. They were walking by in the alleyway. They stopped in the barn to smoke a cigarette. They started the fire. We all like, we've heard the story that it was Mrs. O'Leary and the cow, but honestly, I think that speaks more to the gender politics of historians up until recent, recent decades. Let's blame the immigrant 
family. No, no, let's not blame the immigrant family. Let's blame the, the wife of the immigrant family for this major disaster. When in fact, now she bears some responsibility, but she, doesn't, she didn't actually start the fire. Who started the fire according to Billy Joel? Peg Leg and Dennis, they started the fire. So they started their fire. They tried to put it out by stomping on it or yelling at it or whatever they were trying to do. Ultimately, they ran over to the house and they alerted the O'Learys, woke the O'Learys up. It was 8, 830 in the evening, uh, no electricity so in their home. So they had already gone to bed. And the O'Learys realized that the fire was burning away from their home. So they really didn't care. And they didn't do anything about it. None of their immigrant neighbors did anything about it either. So like I say, they, they certainly own some responsibility, but not uh, according to legend, they didn't actually start the fire. One hour later, one hour later, so at approximately 9.30 p.m., a telegraph operator several blocks to the east reported the fire, reported the fire uh, through the telegraph system to the Chicago Fire Department. Now I'm gonna show some close-ups of this map on the right here. Uh, at that point, fire had already expanded beyond the barn to adjacent buildings and embers, chunks of burning material were blowing downwind onto other dry fuels, other buildings, piles of timber, wooden sidewalks. Remember Chicago was a wooden city at this point. So the fire was starting to move. Now, if you look at the map here, uh, that little green area, Right here, that's where the fire burned on October 7th. This is the O'Leary's cow barn or stable. That's where the fire started the next day at about 8.30 p.m. So over the next several hours, uh, it wasn't just a, a building fire. The Chicago fire turned into an urban conflagration. And that means that fire was jumping from building to building. And, uh, Witnesses recall embers falling like hailstones throughout downtown. Before dawn, most of the loop was in flames. So before dawn on October 9th, most of the loop was in flames. Residents, visitors, homeless were streaming north trying to escape the fire. Just after midnight on October 9th, the fire jumped the river. Now, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and I want to, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, reach out to me about wildfire mitigation and why wasn't mitigation done with the Marshall fire? For example, why wasn't mitigation done here and mitigation there? Mitigation, trying to reduce the risk of a wildfire is clearly ineffective if a wildfire, or, excuse me, if this urban conflagration can jump the Chicago river. And I, I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later. So fire jumped the river on October 9th and it immediately upon jumping the river, somehow these embers found the waterworks. And that meant that as the waterworks burned, the pumps for the city's pipe system stopped working. So the hydrants shut down. There was no more water running through hydrants for firefighters to use. Refugees continued streaming northward and it wasn't until the evening of October 9th that a light drizzle began to fall in Chicago and there was also sparser fuel. So the fire started to die out and then a big rainstorm hit just after midnight in Chicago uh, going from the 9th to the 10th and that's when the fire stopped. It wasn't the action of firefighters, it was the action of the weather. The weather supercharged this fire and the weather eventually stopped this fire. And this is what was left of Chicago. When I look at these photographs, clearly this is more of an inner city or a bigger city sort of view, but the destruction to me looks mighty similar to a lot of the photos that we've all seen from the Marshall Fire. William Croden, a Jedi master of environmental history, uh, he wrote a great book about Chicago, uh, the history of Chicago actually, and this was a quotation from his book uh, that I'll reference in the bibliography later. The entire downtown was laid waste in a single night. Some more photos. This is, uh, you can see the Chicago River here. The fire jumped clean over, wiped out a lot of the boats, a lot of the ships there. Very little was left. 
A great fire equals a great cost. There were 300 people known to have died in that fire. However, that number does not count the number of undocumented immigrants who were in the city at that time, nor does it include residents who were homeless before the fire started, nor does it include tourists, nor does it include transients. There were 300 known dead. I would, I would bet there were several hundred more, if not thousands more people who just were unaccounted for and their bodies were incinerated. The fire left over 100,000 people homeless. There was $200 million in property loss, which equates to about $3.5 in today's dollars. Great quotation from Jonas Hutchinson. Uh, the city was in ruins. This is the fire that we talk about with the great Chicago fire. And because Chicago is the windy city, by the way, it's called the windy city, not because the wind blows there. It's called the windy city because everybody from Chicago from its first settlement to today, loves to brag about Chicago. And so other people around the country called it the Windy City because they were tired of hearing the hot air from residents of Chicago. That's why it's called the Windy City. I have a lot of great friends from Chicago. I'm not ripping on you, I'm just saying, let's be honest here. But on the same day, October 8th, 1871, there was another fire burning to the north in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, but because its residents were not bragging about it. People don't know about it. In 1871, Peshtigo, Wisconsin, which is a, just a little bit north of Green Bay, you can see it on the map there. It was a logging town with a population of about 2,000 people. They said that they had a billion trees on 1 million acres. Now, I, I'm not gonna go out and count, I'm just gonna take the word for it. It was at the mouth of the Peshtigo River, which was fast enough and deep enough to float trees from the surrounding forest down to the sawmills. It was a railroad route. Several railroads went through Peshtigo. It had three churches, two hotels, but no police department and certainly no fire department because they're humans, the optimism bias. What could possibly go wrong? And again, if you see that little imaginary Murphy figure running through the streets, you'd be onto something. The forest was 16.5, 16 and a half feet from buildings. When we talk about the wildland urban interface of today, oh, we've never had a wildland urban interface until the last 50 years. Come on, are you kidding me? All of North America, no. The entire, all land masses in the, on the planet, that's wildland urban interface. When it comes to wildfire, then we're talking about the temperate areas, sure. But anyway, another, another soapbox time. Engage me some of the time and we'll talk all about it. It wasn't just Peshtigo though. There, we also had the sugar bush communities. Around 4,000 people were known to live in settlements around Peshtigo. And that was an area named, the sugar bush was named for the sugar maples that grew there. A lot of my people, immigrants from Norway and Sweden, as well as immigrants from Germany and, and Prussia, they had abandoned the cities or they couldn't afford to live in the cities. So they'd be, they did the pioneer thing, the homesteading thing, going out into the woods, clearing their, uh, the land of trees, they're burning slash and stumps, planting crops and trying to make a go of it. It's the American way, it's the American dream. So let's go back to our weather map. The lower arrow shows where Chicago is, the upper arrow, the upper purple arrow shows where Peshtigo is. So it was windy, it was actually like literally windy in Chicago on October 8th, but up in Peshtigo, it was windier. The narrow spacing indicates higher winds, in this case, 60 mile per hour sustained winds with uh, higher winds gusting above that. Uh, sounds like the weather that was affecting Boulder County in, on December 30th, 2021, if you ask me, hurricane force winds. And again, note the wind direction. The wind direction in this case, uh, we call it a southwesterly wind indicating that it came from the Southwest blowing to the Northeast. There was plenty of fuel in the Peshtigo, in the greater Peshtigo metropolitan area. Of course, there was a, a, a forest. There were structures that were made of wood. There was wood at the sawmills waiting to be planed. There was finished wood, lumber waiting to be shipped out on railroads and on ships. The dried marshes because of the horrible summer drought, the dried marshes were emitting 
methane in record amounts. And there was smoke from stump burning, from peat fires, from fireplaces, from sawmills. I mean, it was October. And leading up to that day, on October 8th, there had been several frosts. So, I mean, it was cold too, right? A, a fall in, a, in Wisconsin. So people were burning fireplaces for light, for cooking, for heat. And there were brush fires. So that all that smoke, remember, smoke is vaporized, dried fuel. Smoke is a fuel and smoke can burn, especially if it's in thick quantities. Now the exact heat source for the Peshtigo fire was never found, but there were plenty of them. Wind was whipping through the forest, so smoldering fires from, from homesteaders burning off slash or dumping a, cleaning out their fireplaces and putting the coals out in the woods or whatever. Wind was whipping those smoldering embers into surface fires and dry lightning from several thunderstorms was peppering the region. So you had lightning, you had these smoldering fires that were getting whipped up by the wind. There was plenty of heat to go around. And eventually that heat coalesced into a fire, not just a fire, a ginormous fire that I would argue was similar to an outdoor flash over. So again, pyrolysis, when orga organic materials are heated, they decompose from solids into gases and the gases are flammable, we call that smoke. Well, we call the blackened part of it smoke, but we could also have those gases floating around, those particles floating around that aren't blackened. A flashover occurs when there's a near simultaneous ignition of the directly exposed combustible material. We usually talk about that in terms of a room. There's, a, there's great flashover videos that you can find on YouTube where the, all the surfaces in a room get to the, because there's a fire burning, get to the same temperature, they're all off-gassing, and then the room itself seems to burst into flames. That's an interior flashover. I would argue that this was an outdoor flashover as well, but when it's an outdoor flashover, we in the fire service tend to call that an area ignition. Multiple fires crank up into a single fire or they, they ignite so rapidly that it's hard to tell one fire from another fire. And that's what happened here at Peshtigo. In fact, this fire created its own weather and there were fire tornadoes rolling through the woods as well. This is a quotation from a book. It's, I would say it's, it's probably the best, it's not the only book I would guess, but it's the best book. Uh, on the Peshtigo fire. And again, I'll refer to this uh, in my bibliography at the end. So survivors of this fire referred to it as the sound of judgment. They said that, that there was a great ball of fire that launched into the town. And I'm not gonna get into the details of this fire no, any more than I did the great Chicago fire because we wanna keep this a kind of an upper level. But if you are interested in this, there's, uh, there's great resources out there about, to learn about this otherwise forgotten incident. Increase Lapham, he was a uh, amateur meteorologist who lived in Peshtigo. He remembered seeing these sheets of flame going through the woods and through the town. Another survivor said it sounded like a thousand locomotives rushing at full speed. Imagine what the survivors, and of course, most everybody survived the Marshall Fire. Imagine what they heard. We, we know what they saw because we saw it on the news, but I have a feeling they heard a lot of the same stuff. Uh, Fort Embarrass, which was uh, a few miles to the west, I believe, the, the uh, official weather station, uh, and it was the Army Signal Corps who was in charge of the weather stations at that point. A week later said the destruction by the fire is incalculable. The newspaper accounts do not tell the losses. And when I think about all these losses, I think about the Marshall Fire. And so the connections to me are obvious. Peshtigo, at least 2,000 people died. Those are the known dead. That does not include the loggers who were out in the woods that day or the transient workers or the sugar bush residents or all the Menominees, Ojibwes, and Anishinaabe who lived in the woods at that time because according to historians, they didn't count. According to census workers, they didn't count. But to say that Wisconsin had no Native Americans living in it is naive. 
So what was the, the total death count from this fire? Who even knows? The fire burned 1.2 million acres on both sides of Green Bay. When we think about embers moving over a six foot, in, when we think about a mega fire like this, when we think about who's to blame for not having mitigation in place, the embers from the Peshtigo fire crossed Green Bay, which is roughly 30 miles across at this point. So yeah, the, the great Chicago fire passed the Chicago River. You couldn't throw a stone across there, but that wasn't as wide as Green Bay. This fire crossed Green Bay. This fire incinerated Peshtigo and 11 other towns in this part of Wisconsin. This was a mega fire, just like Chicago was a mega fire. And there were other fires burning the same day as well that most people don't know about. For example, the Port Huron fire burned in Michigan. Uh, Port Huron, White Rock, the Thumb region, at least 500 people died there. And again, over a million acres burned. There were actually fires burning in Michigan from the west coast of Michigan to the east coast of Michigan. There were wildfires burning in Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, in the Sierras and the Rockies, the Alleghenies, the entire, I don't want to say the, in the entire country was on fire, but every region of the country had big wildfires in October, the first couple of weeks of October of 1871. So legacy of these fires. Really, the legacy could be attributed to the Great Chicago Fire because that's where everybody's attention went. But there was a little bit of a wink and a nod to the Peshtigo Fire as well and the other fires. But on October 9th, 1911, the Fire Marshals Association of North America established Fire Prevention Day to recognize Peshtigo, Great Chicago, as well as the Triangle Fire, which had occurred six months before. President Wilson established a National Fire Prevention Day in 1920. President Coolidge, who's pictured here, established Fire Prevention Week in 1925. And he also did that because of the 15,000 Americans who died in fires the previous year. And Coolidge had it right. This waste results from conditions that justify a sense of shame and horror for the greater part of it could and ought to be prevented. And I would just say guilt and horror. I'm not a big fan of shame, but again, that's a soapbox for another time. So the fires had mixed legacies. Chicago certainly was rejuvenated after the great Chicago fire. Small businesses, middle-class residents abandoned downtown Chicago for the suburbs. And that let the architects walk in and create basically a, a whole new loop in Lakefront. And it's in fact that architecture is called the Chicago School. On the other end of the spectrum, US and British military officials studied Peshtigo and the Great Chicago Fire to figure out how to weaponize fire for World War II. And this uh, painting, the backdrop here is by Ellen O'Hara Slavic. That's the way she spells her name. That's not just poor grammar on my part, just so you know. Uh, but that is her painting, Dresden, part of her series. Uh, she did a series of paintings uh, showing cities that the US military had bombed over time. Again, this is Dresden. She did a similar one for Tokyo. So lessons for us. If you see something, say something. Call 911. Don't be like the O'Leary's and their neighbors. Oh, the fire is burning away from our house. It's not my problem. No, it is your problem because it's our problem. We need to remember that the United States of America was not founded on individualism. It was founded on a social compact where we all help each other. Thousands of Chicagoans had no insurance or their insurance proof burned. How many of you have checked your insurance policies recently for your home and its contents? If you live in an apartment like me, for my apartment, my contents of my apartment, we need to take responsibility and make sure our insurance papers are up to date. And it's important that we do an inventory of our homes wherever we live. Put the inventory on video. Don't save the, the thumb drive with your video at home because then it could burn too. Save it on the cloud, save it in a safe deposit box somewhere else. Give it to a friend who lives in a different zip code. I have friends who evacuated for the Marshall Fire and they, right before they left, they were trying to do a quick video of their home because they weren't sure the home would be there. Practice your home escape plan, especially in balloon framed homes. Practicing your home escape plan means that regardless of your age, little kids, not little kids anymore, 
practice uh, activating the smoke alarm, go outside to your family meeting place. But don't just stop there. Evacuate, do a, a home evacuation plan, but also do a neighborhood evacuation plan. So you know where to go if the neighborhood needs to evacuate, whether it's for a wildfire, for hazardous material spill, for anything else. And register for your county's reverse notification system. For those of us who live in Douglas County, we can go to dcsheriff.net and click on the links for code red. It's easy. It's so easy. I was able to fix my own gap in that. For a couple of years, I lived in Highlands Ranch and I had registered for Highlands Ranch or my address in Highlands Ranch and negligence. I mean, I'm doing it too. I moved to Lone Tree and I didn't update my information. So preparing for this presentation, I finally updated my information and I will now receive the code red alerts for Lone Tree as well. Incidentally, my mom lives up in Idaho Springs and several years ago, I registered for Clear Creek County's reverse notification so that I could know when my parents' home was threatened as well. And that leads us to December 30th, 2021. So 150 years later, hurricane force winds drove a wildfire, drove a small fire. Remember, all big fires start small. Somehow, we don't know what the cause of this fire was yet. Somehow, this small fire was captured or invigorated by hurricane force winds that blew it to the east. A small wildfire transformed rapidly into a mega fire. We know of two people who died, 30,000 people evacuated, and over 1,000 homes and other structures were destroyed. This is a photograph that one of our firefighters took when they reached uh, the fire zone. So I wanted to share with you some insights from the Marshall Fire. The Marshall Fire, from my humble opinion, being in the fire service since 1998, being a firefighter in Clear Creek County for 15 years, being in risk reduction since, I guess formally since 2003, but really since I was first a firefighter in 98. The Marshall Fire was two types of fires. Initially, it was a wind-driven wildland urban interface fire that cruised through the largely open space area between Marshall and the towns or the cities of Louisville and Superior. As it was burning, again, driven by those hurricane force winds, not, uh, the wind wasn't always above 100 miles per hour, but was still 60, 70, 80 miles per hour. The fire burned through several homes tragically burned through several homes. Those homes may have ignited from direct flame contact, may have, gen may have uh, ignited from radiant heat, probably ignited from embers from that fire landing on those homes. Once the fire got into Louisville and Superior, it was no longer a wildfire. It was then an urban conflagration, which is what hit Chicago. Uh, so it's important to to separate those two out in our minds, in my opinion, because once the fire went into the urban areas or the, the suburban urban areas, that was then a home to home ignition scenario. So the embers weren't just from the grassland that was on fire, the embers were from other homes that were on fire. Stuff around those homes and chunks of those homes were hitting other homes and breaking windows and homes were igniting faster than firefighters could get from home to home to home. It was then a mega fire. And I've had people question just in the last week or so, question whether at South Metro, we recommend that for the best defense against a low to moderate intensity wildfire, when we're talking about open space areas or pastures or uh, grassy areas, create a six foot wide mow strip. And that will act as a speed bump against a low to moderate intensity wildfire to slow that fire's growth. Clearly, a six foot wide mow strip is not going to stop an extreme intensity wildfire from burning into a neighborhood. Uh, US 36 didn't stop the Marshall Fire from burning into Louisville. If an eight lane highway, the equivalent of an eight lane highway is not gonna stop a fire, no amount of mow strip is gonna stop a fire either. 
So these mega fires, the Great Chicago Fire jumped the Chicago River. The Peshtigo Fire jumped Green Bay. The Marshall Fire jumped Highway 36. Thinking about another mega fire in our recent history, the uh, East Troublesome Fire, remember that from October of 2020. That fire jumped the Continental Divide. Mega fires don't care about mitigation. Mega fires keep going until the fuel stops or until the weather changes so that firefighters have a chance to do their thing against low to moderate intensity fires at that point. So what's the role of mitigation? Mitigation works for low to moderate intensity wildfires. In a mega fire, unfortunately, all bets are off. And for me in a risk reduction sort of uh, position, it's devastating on a personal and professional level as well, which is incredibly selfish, but that's what I'm feeling right now. The Marshall Fire also teaches us the significance of being prepared for an evacuation. So how much of Colorado is in a wildfire zone? I would say all of it, straight up, all of it. Embers could blow from anywhere into our neighborhoods and start big wildfires. So we should all be prepared for evacuations. We all should register for reverse notification. We all should practice neighborhood evacuation plans. In conjunction with the fire department, the county office of emergency management, county sheriff's office, or just on your own as a family, do it. And it's critical that we leave early. So wildfire preparedness tips. Inventory your home. It's going to take a while. I, I don't advise you do the whole thing in a day. Pick one room this week, this coming weekend, pick your family room. Next weekend, pick a bedroom. The next weekend, pick another bedroom. Slowly inventory your home so that at the end of the spring, maybe even by wildfire preparedness day, which is the first Saturday in May, you're done. Defend your home against embers. And most homes ignite from embers. They don't ignite from a wall of flame coming through. They ignite from embers. Remove all junipers within 30 feet of your property. Clean your gutters. Anywhere on your decking or the bottom of the, the exterior walls where you see dead needles or dead leaves collecting from the wind, that's where the embers are going to land. And if they find easy fuel, that's where the fire is going to start. Again, create family evacuation plans and family communication plans. Your family evacuation plan should be, okay, as a family, if we're separated and there's a reason to evacuate the neighborhood, we're all going to meet here in a different zip code. Maybe it's at a shopping mall. Maybe it's at a, a family member's house out of zip code, somewhere further away that's probably not threatened by the same hazard or the same incident. If you're all home, great, then you can all go together. Your evacuation plan should be should include roughly what are you going to take? Which car are you going to take? Are you going to take that collector's Corvette that hardly holds anything? You're never going to be able to throw the big dogs in there. Or do you take the sedan or the minivan and leave the Corvette behind because at least you can grab the dogs with, your, with the minivan? Your family communications plan. Designate a family or member or a close friend in a different zip code so that you call them with your updates and all your other family members and friends call that person to get updates on your status. Because I have a feeling that when you're evacuating, the last thing you wanna do is answer your cell phone. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? I gotta leave, that's how it's going. Everybody else calls a family member in a different zip code, you'll call them with an update as soon as you can. But right now, you have other things going on. Know how to function in your home without electricity. There were several survivors of the Marshall Fire who said the power went out and they didn't know how to open their garage door. And that to me is tragic. Now, the first home I lived in in Jefferson County, the old garage door was heavy and without electricity, I tried. There was no way to open it. But most garage doors now are lightweight enough that if you go to the top, the, the rail in the, uh, the ceiling of your garage, the rail where the the wheel comes up and it brings the garage door up toward the, the back wall. There's usually a red or yellow handle there hanging down. You bonk your head on it if you're 6'5 like me. It scrapes against the top of your car. If you pull that, that's the manual release for your garage door, and you can lift your garage door on your own. You drive your car out of it. You make sure you close your garage door all the way to keep the embers out. 
and then you drive to freedom and safety. Uh, if you live in an area, I was just in one of our district areas that didn't that doesn't have fire hydrants. So a lot of them are relying on well water. If you're relying, if you're gonna, if your plan is to stay behind and use your well water to fight the fire, what happens when the electricity goes out and your well doesn't work anymore? In other words, don't don't wait around until it's too late, relying on electricity, and now you're stuck. Uh, in terms of get ready, get set, go. We at South Metro Fire Rescue, we follow the Ready, Set, Go materials, and I can send that to all of you. I can even send it to Nancy or Sarah. Maybe you can put that on the uh, Highlands Ranch Historical Society website, and certainly on our website, southmetro.org. And it just gives you tips, other tips on how to prepare so that you're ready for anything that happens. And then when the emergency occurs, you get set. And if you need to, you're ready to go. It's that simple. And incidentally, when you get the evacuation notice from the county and the county's reverse notification message, it's a pre-recorded message. It'll say something like, there's an emergency in your neighborhood. You need to evacuate. You need to evacuate to the north or to the east or to the west. They'll tell you, it'll give you a little bit of direction. They'll tell you where to get more information. They'll tell you where the identified shelters are. Don't wait. And for goodness sakes, don't call your local fire station. Hey, is this for us? Yes, it's for you. You received the call. You registered for the call. Act on it right now. We as humans, we're like, a lot of us think, well, you know, if I just call my neighbor, maybe they'll give me some clarification. Maybe I call the local fire station. They're busy. They're fighting the fire. Just go. Err on the side of caution. Because your life is more important. I shouldn't point over here. I should point right there. Your life is important to all of us. Don't wait, go, go early, you'll be safer. How do we help Boulder County? Uh, I highly recommend the, Bo the Community Foundation of Boulder County. Uh, they are activated, they've been activated for several years to help out with all the horrible crises that that community has had to deal with over the last few years. You can also donate to the American Red Cross. You can donate to the Salvation Army. American Red Cross and Salvation Army both have volunteer opportunities. I think the Community Foundation does as well. I'm sure that a majority of the places of worship in our district uh, have programs going on. Uh, schools have been raising money and, and you know, finding coats and all sorts of good things to, to help out all the residents who lost their homes or lost their livelihood. And, I think about my friends whose home survived the fire, but they're also now full of smoke and ash. The home survived, but it's like a different place and they've got, a, they've got all this uh, restoration that has to be done before they can move back in as well. Businesses shut down, people lost jobs, lost access to jobs. This is a community definitely in need of help. So if you can help, that'd be great. This photo, by the way, it looks a little weird. It's like, oh, what's the, with the glare there? That photograph is from one of our battalion chiefs, and that's what he saw as he reached one of the neighborhoods. So you can see the, uh, the glare there is from the, the dashboard lights. Uh, if you look closely enough on the mid, the, the bottom center, you can actually see what he's looking at in his rear view mirror uh, on the left side of the car and the home to home to home ignition. So I'm a, I'm a historian. I cite my sources. Uh, here's my bibliography, Cronin's book, Guess and Lutz's book, uh, Peter Charles Hoffer, Seven Fires, great book, uh, some other resources here. That first one on this page, uh, if you ask me, that's a fine book to have in your collection as well, Ancient Fire, Modern Fire, written by me. Uh, John Morris, great book from the 50s on fires and firefighters. Future presentations. Uh, on January 25th, the Hyatt Regency walkway collapse. February 22nd, nightclub fires. March 15th, outhouses and risk reduction. It's pretty cool. May 10th, 1947, Texas City explosion. If you want to get on the mailing list, there's my email address. I forgot to put that on the slide. Take a picture of that with your cell phone. Jot it down super quickly. Or, you know, you can probably get it from Nancy or Sarah or DJ or someone else. Uh, get on the mailing list. I would also love it. If you guys were to fill out the survey for me, if you don't want to fill out the survey, at the very least, 
if you go to the chat function and you put your age and your zip code, that would be ginormously helpful as well. Just so I get an idea of who's watching this presentation. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll feel better about, about myself a little bit. Otherwise, I'm gonna go to the chat box right now. And while this uh, survey link is on the screen. All right, let's go up here to question. Does a mega fire equate to a fire storm? Yes. Uh, that was a direct message to me, but I'm going to answer it for everybody. Mega fire is just another term for a fire storm. Uh, if you ask me that mega fire was a term, I don't know that it was coined by Jack Cohen, but Jack Cohen is a Jedi master in uh, urban interface fires and building ignitions, wildfires, that sort of thing. He used to work at the fire science lab in Missoula. He's now retired. And he started referring to these wildfires that burned into and through cities as mega fires. And that is certainly an adequate term for uh, these fires. It would also apply to Black Forest, to Waldo Canyon. Uh, those are the two big ones I would say in Colorado that would apply to mega fire. But honestly, uh, East Troublesome was a mega fire. Most of the fires that burn in campfire in California. You get the gist. All right, let's keep going down here. A lot of zip codes. Thank you. All right, all right. What was the website for the reverse notification? Hey, I'm going to type this into the chat box right now. Oh, and I sent that directly because I'm a goofball. Everyone in the meeting, I'm going to try it again. DC Sheriff. Net. Yeah, there you go. DCSheriff.net will get you the link to uh, register for Code Red, which is Douglas County's reverse notification system. If you happen to live in Arapahoe County, you can search for RAP Alerts. If you're in Jefferson County, that link is far bigger, but go to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office website and look for their reverse notification. And here is my email address. Like There's something else I was gonna, and uh, yeah, okay. And I'm gonna put the survey link on here as well. Hopefully I don't gaff the typing here. Survey monkey. All right, groovy. You guys are awesome. So uh, I guess I'm ready to turn things. Oh, oh, I should put this on the. Let me come back here. One more slide here, DJ. Put the logos up. And uh, that's our website. That's my email address again. If you have any questions, reach out. Any questions about anything, reach out and uh, look forward to seeing you all in person at Southridge. Uh, sometime in the future. Thank you. DJ, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, presentation. And thank you for everyone who uh, came out this evening. Uh, we'll wrap up our presentation here. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully at Southridge, everybody there for February for the Norman Rockwell's neighbor. And that sounds like it's going to be a really good program, and we look forward to seeing you in person. So with that, we will uh, wrap up for this evening, and we will stop our recording. Thank you all.